The Hausa are a West African people. Most of them live in northern Nigeria. Most Hausas are Muslims. Their culture is a mixture of Africa and Islam. Colorful religious festivals are held annually in Hausaland. They feature a variety of musical instruments, traditional costume and dances. In this procession are hunters with their locally made shotguns and these horsemen are visitors from neighboring Bornu. Long trumpets first came to Hausaland in the 15th century. They are played especially for the emirs, the traditional rulers of Hausaland. This man plays for the emir of Zaria. Here is his chief drummer, and these musicians play side-blown antelope horns. The most beautifully decorated building in the heart of Zaria is the Emir's Palace. The Emir's bodyguards can be recognized by their special uniforms. Today, the Emir usually travels by motor car. But he still wears traditional dress. His robes are made locally in Zaria and Kano. Elaborately embroidered men's clothing can be seen in every Hausa town. Some of the embroidery is still sewn by hand, but nowadays much of it is made with sewing machines. This modern design has been created by machine embroiderers. Many of the machine embroiderers work without any preliminary drawing to guide them. This machine sews with a chain stitch, whereas this one operates with a zigzag motion. Since the 1950s, coloured hand-embroidered caps have been replacing turbans. Many of the caps are made by Quranic scholars to help maintain themselves while studying. A great many of the embroiderers work at home. The designs for larger hand-embroidered garments are usually drawn by specialists. This is Malam Tanko, a draftsman of Zaria. Here he is drawing a design on a woman's wrapper. His pen is a piece of sharpened corn stalk. The ink is a liquid mixture containing white clay. Malam Tango is both a draftsman and an embroiderer. The traditional patterns he uses are largely abstract. The drawing complete, he now begins to sew. Oh, 
by his side on the mat are the coloured wools that eventually will be sewn onto the finished garment. Some embroidery patterns are also used by calabash decorators. Calabashes or gourds are the fruit of creeping plants that grow both in the fields and around the houses. Most calabashes find their way to local markets. Undecorated calabashes are in common use as utensils. In spite of a decline in house or craft work, a great variety of handmade articles is still produced. Among the products of the craftsmen are rope, baskets for holding grain, and matting, often used for screening around a compound. Palm frond material for basketry is brought in by camel from Niger. This hard-wearing material is particularly suitable for making products that are in constant use in and about the house. Almost every person in this village to the north of Kano, where these people are working, is involved in basketry. This basket maker is using his toe as a third hand in order to twist the fibers in making pot holders. Though there is strong competition from factory-made enamel ware and plastics, traditional pottery is still made by the Hausa. Most Hausa potters live close to their sources of clay. The raw clay is dug out with a hoe and then carried back to the compound where it is worked into a manageable state. Malam Garba beats out his pots with a pestle of baked clay. Whilst beating the clay, the potter turns it in a saucer-shaped hollow in the ground, and in this way the pot begins to take shape. The lubricant he uses for working the pot is not water, but dry clay powder, and the decoration is sometimes made by rolling a small roulette over the clay surface. Malam Garba has several women potters in his compound. Here, in this different method of making pottery, the clay is worked around an old pot, which provides the shape for the new one. The new pot is lifted from the mould. Later on, unlike his European counterpart, who uses a wheel, the Hausa craftsman finishes off the pot by working the clay as he moves around it. Finally, he adds the decoration by pressing on a pattern with his finger. Malam Hassan also makes a useful cooking apparatus which combines the stove and several cooking pots. Here he is completing one of the small pots by rubbing colour onto the inside surface of the vessel. The pots are fired close to the potter's compound. Because the women live largely in seclusion, their pots are carried out and fired for them. 
grass is first laid over the ashes of the previous firings. Most of the pots made by the Hausa are for domestic use. Hausa potters start their training at a very early age. In the further preparation of the fire, brushwood is now laid on top of the grass. Hausa women have an eye for a good pot even before it is fired. There are many pots to be fired and therefore to accommodate them all and to ensure even firing, they have to be carefully arranged on top of the brushwood. The whole operation takes place between Malam Hassan's compound and his crops. The pots are sufficiently sturdy to be stacked in several layers. The lightest items, such as lids for the pots, go onto the pile last. Preparations for firing are completed by covering the pots with a final layer of grass. For the pots to become well baked, they must be subjected to heat for a fairly long period and therefore to prevent the fuel from burning too quickly, water is sprinkled over the grass. To slow down the burning and to retain the heat still further, ash is scooped up and thrown on top of the heap. firing begins in the evening when there is less breeze and less chance of sparks blowing onto nearby thatched roofs. By the following morning the fire has burnt out and the pots are cool enough to handle. seen whether local demands for Hausa pottery will continue amid the sweeping changes now taking place throughout West Africa. Hausaland produces good quality cotton and some of it is still used by Hausa weavers. <laughs> The men specialize in producing narrow strips of cloth on a horizontal loom with two heddles. The heddles are moved by the feet. Each heddle is raised in turn while the shuttle carries the weft thread back and forth across the warp. This essentially portable type of loom was probably used for the first time in West Africa by nomadic herdsmen far to the west of Hausaland. The narrow strips of cloth made on the men's loom are later cut up and sewn edge to edge to produce wider pieces of cloth for blankets and garments. The women's loom is a vertical structure on which cloths are woven that are both wider and shorter than those of the men. By comparison with the men's weaving, this is a much slower process. Decoration is inlaid with coloured threads. Cloths of this kind are used as women's wrappers. 
this particular pattern features a motif based on the Quranic writing board. The Hausa are also renowned for their cloths dyed with indigo. The dyeing is done in deep cement-lined pits. When the dye has lost its strength, the liquid and the sediment are removed. The sediment is made into lumps and burnt, and then reused in the pits. The dark and glossy indigo cloth of the houses was formerly very fashionable and is still more expensive than the lighter varieties. The glossy effect is achieved by beating powdered indigo into cloth that has already been dyed. The implement that is used is a heavy wooden mallet. This Hausa commentator is discussing a strange document he obtained in Mecca. From sources such as this, Hausa art may once have derived some of its inspiration. Another common craft of the Hausas is leatherwork. This printed paper, which includes quotations from the Quran, is being made into a protective charm for wearing around the neck. The paper is folded and then tied up with cotton. The next stage is to enclose the Quranic paper in a piece of goatskin coated with porridge in order to make the loose edges of the leather stick together. Having trimmed off the surplus material, the craftsman sews up the packet. Using a piece of wood, the leather is pressed smooth before a pattern is inked onto it. All that remains to be done is to open up the end of the packet through which the neckband will be threaded. A charm to protect him against misfortune. This straw shelter is the dry season home of a Quranic teacher. This morning he has two pupils from the nearby village. One pupil is memorizing a passage from the Quran. The other is taking personal instruction from the teacher inside the shelter. Quranic teaching follows much the same pattern, whether it be in rural areas or in the towns. Malam Sa'adu is drawing a special pattern to decorate the writing board of one of his pupils who has just completed a set task of learning. Calligraphy and pattern making are an integral part of Quranic activity, though some of the patterns drawn by the scholars are also found in other kinds of Hausa decorative art. By combining arabesque and interlacing motifs, each Quranic scholar makes up his own particular designs. Similar patterns are also used by Hausa wall decorators, though sometimes their work may be little more than a row of pinnacles. Hausa wall decorations begin around doorways and window openings, as in the case of this mosque and this entrance to a compound. This abstract design is around the doorway of one of the oldest houses in Zaria, for many years the home of a wealthy trader. And this doorway, decorated around 1940, incorporates several pot lids made of colored enamel. 
Whereas wall decoration was originally confined to interiors, it has now spread and proliferated on exterior walls. In more recent times, some wall decorations have recorded the arrival of Western technology. Wall decorations in plaster are a modern development, with roots in both the past and the present. This mural makes reference to the local sport of boxing. The availability of industrially produced paints has resulted in a novel use of bright and varied colours. This decoration is on the wall of a cinema. The most outstanding innovator in recent years was Musa Yola. His work was characterised by a perceptive interpretation of contemporary life. Whether portraying a drummer or a donkey, Musa Yola's wall decorations reflect the rapidly changing face of the Hausa environment. His buoyant work is a healthy sign for the future of Hausa art. May it never come to an end.